Hi everybody, this video is to cover my experience with taking videos of model trains and recently I've been getting more into N-Scale and much to my surprise it's actually been kind of fun to photograph and at first I thought you know N-Scale is so tiny um, what on earth am I going to do except get really frustrated by this so I decided to try it and I've got a DSLR camera and what I did was I, I researched the features of my camera and you know basically what do I need to do to do macro photography or very small scale photography so I don't want to get into all of the technical details but I want to share some of the, my thoughts on, on what um, videos of trains should look like if you want them to be more realistic and of course this is just my experience uh, your mileage may vary, and of course, I welcome everybody's feedback. Um, so uh, I'll just share a little bit of my thoughts. So for this video, what I will do is just give an overview of why I think model train videos are hard, um, and my former experience trying to do them. Uh, then I want to go to what I learned to get better video and more realism out of my train videos. And then finally, I'll show some video clips and, and walk through some examples. So um, I hope this is helpful, and let's get started. So why is it so hard to get a good video of a model train? I think that it's partly because we experience trains in miniature very differently than in real life. So if you think about the differences between those, your photography should address those differences. And I'll get into this more in this video. And I'll also do a more in-depth uh, video on photography and all of the finer points of that. Second, I think that trains are just a tricky subject. Uh, the, the physics involved with a real train are very different than the physics involved with a model train. And of course, those trains behave very differently and and you interact with them very differently because of that so there's another area to consider as you're creating your train videos so there's good news uh, most cameras have some capability of getting good shots of trains so I invite you to get to know your camera and find out what it's capable of what its strengths are what its weaknesses are and then apply that camera to model railroad photography with that in mind. And that's going to get you a long way. So with that in mind, let's look at our first example. For my first tip, let's take a look at this video clip. Notice how close these trains are to the camera. So when, when you see that train coming, it's, it's like it's coming at you. You see it coming around the curve. And this is because these trains basically fill up the frame. I get as close to these trains as possible and that way of course we can see them you know really well as opposed to if I was further back it just wouldn't have that same impact. If you think about this intuitively it makes sense because in real life you're probably going to see that train fill up your field of view. If you're close to a train that train is big and it's probably going to, to fill up everything that you can see. So in the model, you want to duplicate that same effect. Get the camera as close to the train as possible or use a telephoto lens and fill up the frame with that train. I like to fill the frame about one-third with the train, one-third with the foreground, and one-third with the background. So my first tip is to fill up the frame as much as possible. Now this is also where you want to know the capabilities of your camera because although you want to be close to the train you don't want it to be out of focus. So know how to manually focus on the train so that you can get a clear close-up uh, that is in focus. For my next tip let's take a look at this video clip. One of the things that I notice most is that in daily life we generally stand next to tracks um, that are 
on some kind of a roadbed or they're on an embankment or some other you know kind of thing and um, generally that rail that the train is riding on is at least say waist high or even higher especially in the United States if you're looking at trains that are on the the main line of a major railroad uh, they've got quite a bit of embankment and ballast there that elevates the train. The reason they do that is to drain the ties and to keep the uh, rail from from basically getting um, uh, rotted, you know, or the ties rather from becoming rotted. So that ballast actually serves an engineering purpose of irrigating um, the the water away from the ties, basically. So. When you're photographing a model, you want to duplicate that same kind of perspective. And we often stand above our trains, but in reality, that's exactly how life is not showing trains to us. So if, if we're standing next to trains in real life, chances are we're looking up at them rather than down at them. So one of the things that I like to do is to put my camera on a tripod and get it down low relative to the trains. And sometimes I want to see just the outer rail that's closest to me, or if, if I am close enough to the train, it's kind of neat to see both rails. A second note on perspective applies to passenger trains in particular. Most passenger trains, if they have multiple cars, have diaphragms between those cars so that passengers can walk between the cars. Well, in real life, if you look at any passenger train, these diaphragms touch each other and they're very well connected for obvious safety reasons. But our model trains are different in that there has to be space between the cars and there has to be clearance so that these cars can go around tight curves. So the result is that there's a gap between the cars that exists in the models that really isn't there in real life. So what I've done here is I've positioned the camera so that I'm not looking at the train at a perpendicular angle, but I'm looking at the train at a slightly offset angle, like about 70 degrees or something like that. So what this means is that the train is always passing me in a way that I don't get a look right down the middle of those cars. So where two cars pass, I can see that there's a diaphragm but I really can't see daylight or I can't see what's on the other side of that train through the gap between those cars. So by having an offset angle slightly, it shows that yes, I can see the gap between the cars, but that, that gap is not as apparent as if it was at a 90 degree angle. So hopefully this conveys more of a connected train, uh, much like in real life, rather than gaps between the cars that's exaggerated uh, with model trains. Another thing to think about is the lighting of the, the scene. And um, what typically happens is that there are objects in real life around trains, such as telephone poles, that when the train passes those objects, uh, the object will cast a shadow on the train. And clearly this is something that we see in everyday life and it's just natural to us to, to see that in the physical world. So when I choose where the light source is coming from in my videos, I try to cast shadows on the train and I also try to look at uh, shadows that the train itself casts. Um, or similarly, there may be objects that uh, reflect light on the train, or the, especially a passenger train may reflect light. And so I want to think about, is the train interacting uh, with the objects around it in terms of the shadows that uh, the train casts, as well as the shadow that the objects around the train cast on the train itself. So by thinking about that and choosing the light source appropriately, you can highlight um, that the train is a part of this environment around it and enhance the realism. So a final comment is on physics and uh, the way that real trains handle is a direct consequence of their weight. 
You know, think of in real life, a typical locomotive is in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 tons or more. So that, that means that it'll never be able to start very quickly and it'll never be able to stop very quickly. So if, if you were to scale down uh, the weight of a locomotive, let's say that 80 ton locomotive in end scale should weigh a thousand pounds. So obviously that's not the case. So we need to kind of run our trains in our videos like they're heavy. And if you've got a DCC system or a power pack with a momentum feature, that's the reason for that feature to be there. So uh, in general, trains just look more realistic if they're stopping very gradually or if they're starting very gradually. Like I'm just demonstrating here with this Amtrak passenger train uh, stopping at a station. And then finally, just a quick comment on scale speed. This train is going probably about a scale 30 or 40 miles an hour. And for that kind of curve that it's on, that's probably all the faster that would look normal for that train. So just think about the route that your trains are traversing and think of the scale speed that they probably would be going. So that's it. Model train videos are easy if you think about perspective, physics, and overall realism. We need to photograph models differently because we experience and interact with models differently and trains are tricky subjects to begin with. Camera settings are very different for models compared to the real thing, and we'll get into this more later. My advice is to fill the frame with the model and photograph the model at eye level, the same way we experience the train in real life. Think about lighting and accentuate the trains with shadows, highlights, and reflections. Operate the trains as if they have realistic momentum and speed. I should have the video on model railroad photography posted soon. For now, in a nutshell, you can get good shots with most cameras if you know their strengths and limitations. Express yourself through your videos and make them your own. After all, it's a big hobby and we're all unique. Stay at it and let me know if you have any questions. And of course, have fun!